Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I have a loud voice. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, good. My husband says it's very loud, so I guess it is. Uh, he always says, tune it down a little. Um, I'm happy to see so many familiar faces because some of you have known that I went by this building for 18 years to go out to Plymouth to be the director there. And I was proud of my time there. I worked with John Dunville, of course, and Bill Jenny. And we had, a, I think, a great run, right? Uh, we feel that we brought the profile of Calvin Coolidge up and the profile of Grace Coolidge up. And why I speak about Grace Coolidge is I had a board member who used to give talks on Grace Coolidge. And he had a whole bunch of slides. And he came in one day. I don't know if you know the story, John. He came in one day and he said, Cindy, it's you now. And he handed me all his stuff. And so some of the slides are, are in here that he gave me. Because remember, you can take slides and put them in a PowerPoint now. So I have a lot of material. And I have material from the Coolidge Foundation up the street. And um, it's true that I did retire, and mainly because of the commute. Because you could hand over New Hampshire out here. I mean, you know, it got to be a lot. And um, now I am near some of my children. And I even have a grandchild that lives five minutes from me. <laughs> so I have a, a, a lot of other responsibilities. I still teach for the community college. And so I love seeing you real people. Because when I teach at the community college, it's all online. It has to be online because you can only get about three people who want to hear about Vermont history in a room. But if you open it up to the entire state, and even beyond the state, you can get a f filled class. So my classes have been filled for over 25 years, you guys. So I've taught a long, long time. So this semester, I, I'm taking this semester off. Because now the semesters bleed into each other. I don't know if you know what that means. They get you right on to the next semester before you even finish the other one. So I'm taking a little uh, break from teaching. And they've already asked me about next year. So hopefully I can keep going. I don't know. Uh, but I wanted to share some of the story of Grace Coolidge with you because she's one of my favorites. And I haven't been able to talk about her too much because I did have my next book, which is Vermont Women, Native Americans, and African Americans Out of the Shadows of History. And I went around the state talking about that quite a bit. And I've been so pleased that those stories are more elevated now. And lots of people have been uh, talking about uh, those topics. And Vermont Digger was started. Do you, any of you check out Vermont Digger? Mm -hmm. That was started by a friend of mine. I was on her first board, Ann Galloway. And I'm so pleased that you know, she keeps some history going there. So we're doing fine in terms of history. I think the Vermont Historical Society is still pretty strong. Uh, so we should be pleased. And then it's the 100th anniversary of Calvin swearing in, right? And you all went up to spend all night listening to it. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Um, <laughs> you did some of it. And so I'll get to that in my talk. But First, I'll, I'll give you some background, because some of you maybe don't know too much about Grace. She's not a very well-known first lady. They did have a, a series on C-SPAN. Did any of you see that? No? John did. A few people did. And believe it or not, Richard Norton Smith knew that I was the only living expert on Grace Coolidge. There isn't anybody else, guys. Um, so I was on C-SPAN. And it was fun, except it was a call-in show. Did you know that? It was a call-in show. So you couldn't really get a talk going too well, because people called in, like my daughter called in even. And she said, what was the dog that was black that was a chow? OK, Blackberry, I remember that. <laughs> but I mean, it was that kind of thing. So it was, was a, a, a tough show a little bit to do. But it was fun. And if you ever want to, go into, you do for this title, Influence an Image, do First Ladies Influence an Image. And you can still, on the internet, get all those shows. Really, they're still up there with C-SPAN. So think about that. If you're any first ladies you want to study, um, you can. OK, to get on with our story, I started my book. And I'm basing my talk on my book, which is uh, not too available because of the publishers being difficult. But I can tell you more later about that. Uh, but I didn't want to start with her birth. I wanted to start with one of her happiest days. And one of her happiest days was 
April 11, 1924, when she was sure that her husband was doing well, her children were at Mercersburg Academy, that's the two boys, you're going to hear about them. The president's father, Colonel John, was turning 79 and he was in Plymouth, right here. Her mother, Lamira Goodhue, had fragile health and her mother was in Northampton. And you'll hear more about that too as we move along. And why is this day so important? Okay, it was April of 1924, the Pi Phi's Eastern Conference would be held at the White House. Now can you, from this side, can, do you guys, are you able to see okay? This is the largest gathering of fraternity women ever, 1,350. And the Pi Phi's were welcomed through the east entrance of the White House and assembled, and they presented this painting to the White House. They were the sponsors, and that's Grace's fraternity. Now, they called them fraternities in those days. Now we call them sororities. So it was a wonderful painting. Uh, she was in her red dress. That's Rob Roy, the president's collie, next to her. And um, Howard Chandler Christie is the painter. He was painting the painting one day, and Calvin, the president, came by and said, I wanted Grace to be in a white dress. Why didn't you put her in a white dress? And um, Christy said, no, I need contrast. I need a red gown and a white dog. And Calvin said, well, you could have dyed the dog red. <laughs> so he was always up to his little mischief and his little jokes um, in their relationship, I think you could say. Now, then I go back to uh, the story I go back to growing up in Vermont, and here, if you can see, this is a picture from Grace's girlfriend's archives um, of Lamira and Andrew, and they are New Hampshire people. Believe it or not, they grew up in New Hampshire. Um, Lamira was brought up in Merrimack, New Hampshire by her maternal grandmother because her own mother had died, and Grace's father was brought up in Hancock, New Hampshire and he was one of six children and became a mechanical engineer. And that's how we're gonna to get to Vermont because he gets a job in Burlington as a mechanical engineer. That's how it, it moves from New Hampshire to Vermont. And the couple uh, marry and they have one little girl, one. And I often wanna emphasize that because when you have an only child, you can devote yourself to this only child, right? I don't know if any of you are only children. I have some grandchildren that are only children. Um, and Grace was going to be doted upon. Her parents didn't have other children. So she could get, even though she's in Burlington and, it's a, and her father is a mechanical engineer, she's gonna get a lot of attention. She's gonna get music lessons and uh, piano lessons, voice lessons, lots of privileges that, that a Vermont girl might necess not necessarily have. So, it's, so that starts her story a little bit. Her father builds this house. So they come out of company housing and they go to this house. I think it's still there. It's still crummy looking. I don't, <laughs> uh, one of my people in an audience said, Cindy, you wanna save all these first lady homes? Well, I guess you can't do that. But this one, they were, they were in and it, those of you who've been to Burlington, I assume everybody in this room's been to Burlington, you know what a beautiful city it is and how it was a great place to grow up. There were trolley cars, uh, there was sledding down the hills. Her father did a lot of this with her more than her mother and she said she had a lovely childhood except she was an only child again and didn't have that many friends initially because she's an only child. Her father goes on to be an inspector of steamboats. So I'm sure she got on the boats occasionally and had some fun doing that too. Um, he does, does very well. And so you can see there's sort of a successful middle-class family. Why do I emphasize this too, so much? Because presidential families are not usually middle-class. It's quite unusual. Grace and Calvin's leap to the presidency is extremely unusual. Do you all realize that? It, usually it's rich people that get to these. We happen to know a few of those, don't we? <laughs> know of a few. Um, so, so it's a great story about 
how Americans can work for some people very, very well. OK, she goes to her school in Burlington. She's noticed as a fairly good student. She said she wasn't that good. But um, she was asked to speak at her little graduation and all. So I think she was a fairly good student. And then I like to point this out because it shows her uh, thoughtfulness. They were Methodists and went to the Methodist church. And then she heard a speaker, Reverend Peter Snyder, spoke a Burlington con Congregational minister. And so she suggested to her parents, let's move churches. Now, I don't know too many kids who get the parents to move churches, but she did. So they went from being a Methodist to being Congregational. Um, granted, it's Burlington, and I guess it's a city, and things can be accepted, and it was a, a awakening time period. But I like to point this out, that she was thinking, and she had um, sophisticated thinking. All right, and also she's going to the University of Vermont. OK, going to the University of Vermont, there, yes, it's co-ed. It's been co-ed, I think, since 1871. But still, only 19% of women go to college in those days. And I'm looking at all the women here. Um, college was not offered to most women. Remember, she's an only child. She is a girl, but she's an only child, so she's offered to go to college. I mean, even in my um, ancestors, the men were offered college, but not the women. So, this, so she's a little bit unusual that way. Um, before she left um, for a, a, a year, kind of, she had a gap year, believe it or not. They didn't call it that back then. <laughs> to take care of an aunt who was a, a little bit sickly. And before she left, she met Iva Gale. Iva was a shy girl from, the, from a farm on the shores of Lake Memphremagog, and Grace observed how lonely and lost she seemed on the campus, and Grace befriended her. And why I bring this up is Iva was like her sister, and Iva donated some letters to me when I was there <laughs> at the Coolidge Foundation, and they were wonderful. One letter I opened up, and there was a blue feather and a, a, sort of a card attached to it. And that these were letters from Grace to Iva. And in, in the latter part of our story, Iva goes to live with, with Grace. And Grace says, I'll take care of you forever. So it's, it's just a, it's a lovely, lovely friendship. Here, I should show you her picture. There she is. There's Iva. So Grace comes back, of course, and goes to the University of Vermont and feels she must go and have a purpose. But she did have fun, too. And that she and Iva and a few others formed the Pi Phi fraternity. Now they called it, I mentioned that, instead of sorority, you called it fraternity. And this was a branch of the Pi Phi's. Now the Pi Phi's still exist. There's a branch, at, a, a, a branch chapter, you call them chapter, still at UVM. Um, and matter of fact, they made me a Pi Phi. I feel very honored that they made me Pi Phi. Um, and so she had fun, too. She made a, up a song about the Pi Phi's. Uh, she lived it up. She enjoyed college, let's put it that way. But she did live at home. She and Iva lived in the uh, top floor of this building. Her father built this one. So she did live at home, but this building is right next to UVM. This was not much of a walk, because it's still there. It is preserved by Champlain College. No, not Champlain. Is it Champlain? Yeah, it is Champlain. Still preserved, so it's still there. Um, so she could get to campus rather easily, I think we could say. So here she is, the recent graduate. And she said um, she felt she should be serious about life. And this is what um, I quoted from her letters. Most of us were there, meaning at UVM, because of a definite plan, which we had made for the future. And we were trying seriously to prepare ourselves in accordance with it. And she had this feeling after meeting the Yale family in Burlington that maybe she was called to teach deaf children. Now, teaching deaf children is not easy, folks. But this is what Grace decided to do. And here's just a picture of what that would have been like. And she also decided, I think, especially to get into this field because Carolyn Yale, the principal of the school, had developed a foul and consonant charts which were used to teach reading with a phonovisual method. 
So Carolyn Yale was sort of a, uh, I'd say, innovative, thoughtful educator. And so Grace obviously wanted to be in her presence. And so I think that pulled her there as well. So she was there. So she went to Northampton, and her mother, Lamira Goodhue, was reluctant to let her daughter move there. She hoped Grace would teach in the public schools of Burlington after graduation. But her solace was that Northampton was a woman's town, now I'm quoting here, the seat of Smith College, and that she'd been told that very few men who lived there, the very few men who lived there, hardly any men, were married. Lamera could continue to look for an eligible male for her daughter to marry, and one who lived in the Burlington area. She wanted to have a role in Grace's life, perhaps even be the one to find her husband. So Lamira, with this only child, has got her grip on her, right? But she said, oh, OK, you can go to Northampton, because it's all women there anyhow. And she'll never meet a man. No, no hope on that. So this, is, this will be fine. It'll work out. So here she is with some deaf children, or some children. But there's one thing Lamira did not know about. <laughs> we have a neighbor, Calvin Coolidge. Now, he is an up-and-coming lawyer. He studies the law. Did you know in Vermont you can study the law? You don't have to go to a law school? Yes. Yeah. So many of you say, yes, you do know that. Uh, and in those days in Massachusetts, too. I don't think so in Massachusetts anymore. But so he studied the law after going to Amherst College. Remember, he came from Little Plymouth, Vermont. All of you have been up there, right? OK. Came from Plymouth. He was educated in Ludlow at Black River Academy. And then from there, many of you don't know, he had to go up to St. Johnsbury for a year. Did you know that? I knew I'd get something you didn't know. OK. He had to go there for a year. And from St. Johnsbury Academy, you could pass right through to Amherst without taking an exam. He struggled. And I presented this to students sometimes. He struggled. When he first took the exam, he didn't pass. So he went to St. Johnsbury, and he could go right in to Amherst. So he did well at Amherst, though. We should say that. Um, he helped with his Phi Gamma Delta fraternity. Um, and then he was able to read the law and then get a position with a law firm in, in Amherst. So he, by some people thought he was, would be quite a catch. But most people thought she was a better catch. <laughs> but anyhow, that, it's, it's interesting to see. Um, oh, that's Northampton, yeah, at that time period. The other fun story to tell you is that, here, we'll go back and look at his cowlick. Do you see his cowlick? <laughs> right there? OK. Um, he was up shaving one day with his union suit on. Do you know what a union suit is? Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys are old enough to know. Some maybe don't. It's, it's like long underwear and a straw hat. And he had to wear the straw hat to keep the cowlick out of his face. So he was shaving in the window. And she looked up and, and thought, laughed. And he looked down and fell in love. <laughs> that's how the story goes. So that's how they met, right? And then I, I think I am the only one who's read the love letters that he wrote her. Um, and they're just lovely about how he feels about her. Most of his coaching was done by a shoemaker. Did you know that? Jim Lucy, the, uh, Joe Lisa, or Jim, Jim Lucy, the shoemaker. Um, Calvin would go and have his shoes shined. And he'd say, and, and Mr. Lucy would say to him, how are you doing with that gal up on the hill? And he'd say, oh, I'm not doing too well with Grace. I'm not doing too well. He said, well, compliment her more. Write her more notes. Tell her she's beautiful. So you see in his correspondence a lot of that. He goes on and on about how, how beautiful she is and stuff. So he was um, coached. All right, so they do decide to marry. And I've got to go back to the home again, because they marry in this home. And Iva couldn't go. Remember I told you about Iva, the best friend? So um, this is the letter Grace writes to, to Iva. It isn't without a great big sigh and a bigger little pain down in my heart that I begin this last letter before the scene is changed. What she means is this being married. 
That might surprise my mother, who claims to believe that I have no feelings, because I don't talk about them. I sometimes think that those who can speak of them don't always have the most sensitive ones. <laughs> I am sure you and Calvin are going to like one another very much. He is quiet and doesn't say much, but what he does say amounts to something. That's one thing I like about him. These last week, weeks have been pretty hard for us all, I guess. Mother isn't very strong and feels a little bit hard because I am going so hurriedly. And sometimes she says things which strike in pretty deeply. She and Calvin, she hear that? Her mother and Calvin set the time, but she says he was very persistent. He talked with father later in the day and he called him very reasonable. Well, it's almost over now and time will affect a cure. So are you getting the picture? Her mother did not approve of Calvin. He was not up to her level. And her mother went along with it, but she was not happy. And she doesn't really get too happy until they're in the White House. <laughs> she's, she's pretty thinking he's not of her caliber, which is pretty interesting, isn't it? Of course, she doesn't know any of this is going to happen. This is La Mira. And, um, she feels this guy is not going to get anywhere. He's very shy. He doesn't say much. How is this ever going to go anywhere? Um, so how was anyone to really know? So they are in Northampton, and they do go to a two-family house. Now, this two-family house, as far as I know, has not been safe for history. Um, I have toured it a couple of times in my day. Um, it's really small. You know, it is half a house. And it is in Northampton. And that's where they went to set up their, their lives together. And they were very middle class. Matter of fact, I saw a lot of correspondence about Calvin asking his father for support. His father up in Plymouth, Vermont, has to send Calvin money because Calvin can't really make it too well. Um, and that's interesting to think about, too. Here's a close up on the home. And here's a cute couple, right? And then they do have two boys, um, Calvin and John. John uh, is the first one. And Grace writes this, marriage is the most intricate institution set up by the human race. You like that one? <laughs> it is, if it is to be a going concern, it must have a head. That head should be the member of the firm who assumes the greater responsibility for its continuance. In general, this is the husband. In my humble opinion, the woman is by nature the most adaptable of the two, and she should rejoice in this and realize that in the exercise of this ability, she will obtain not only a spiritual blessing, but her own family will rise up and call her blessed. I'm sure a lot of you will agree with that, right? So that was her view of marriage, her view of how she had to do this marriage, because he was going to go into elective office he was going to commute away from Northampton to the general court in, in Boston, and she was going to be alone with the boys. Okay, And I don't know if too many of you have raised your children with your, your husband missing from Monday to Friday, pretty much. And that's what she's going to have to face. So what does she do? She reaches out to her girlfriends in the area. Her girlfriends, and a lot of us feel this way about our girlfriends. Her girlfriends really sustain her and keep her going so that she can, she can raise, these, raise these boys. Um, and, and John Coolidge, who I think some of you knew and I did know, the son, um, who's on the left there, John told me sometimes when his father was home when he was a boy, his father on weekends would say, stop making noise. I need to sleep. I need to rest. So it doesn't even sound like some days he was even that pleasant with the boys, I have to say. So it's an interesting dynamic here. All right, Grace is the one who had religion and interest in music. So here she's playing the piano. John is playing the violin, and that's Calvin Jr.'s banjo. So she instills the, the boys with this interest in religion, in music, in art. Of course, she went to UVM, so she's a college-educated woman. She knows about the world to a degree and is very willing to share that with her boys and feels she should do that with her boys. So um, that's part of their, their life. Okay, of course they come to Plymouth 
to learn about the values of farming and taking care of uh, uh, John, Colonel John's uh, estate up there. Should we call it an estate? <laughs> okay. So here are the boys doing that. And then this is pivotal again, because here is Grace. Um, she was asked by the Pi Fi's to join them in the convention. So she crosses the country with her fraternity sisters. They travel in cars, buses, trains. They party all the way out. Because remember I told you she's a party gal. <laughs> Cal's not, but she is, let's face it. Um, we sang and sang, and we, when we ran out of songs we knew, we sang the chapter songs. They reached San Francisco. The Boston group toured the Pan American Exposition. Grace was elected Alpha Province president. Then the world changed. Hop home, Grace. I'm running for lieutenant governor. OK, why does she have to hop home? Because she's got to help with the campaign. She's got to help with, with the, this big change. This is going to be a statewide campaign. Here's how she looks at that point in history. And he runs for lieutenant governor, then he runs for governor. So all of this is new to her. She stays in Northampton. She does not come into Boston, even though Frank Waterman Stearns, who's the man who was the big promoter of the Coolidge's, of Calvin especially, he was from Stearns department store in Boston. He um, tried his hardest to get Calvin Coolidge to be governor and tried his hardest to make him president. I, I, I think you've heard of people like this before, right? Be, why? I think you should ask why. Because they went to Amherst College. And he wanted an Amherst man to be successful. And so that's, that was his devotion. It turned out they became very, very close friends. And Frank Waterman Stearns and his wife stayed at the White House many times. And he was a big, big promoter of the Coolidge's. And he even offered to pay for a house on Beacon Hill. He said, you know, as governor, you have no house in, in uh, Massachusetts. You know, you have no house here in Vermont either if you're governor. Um, I said, he said, I'll pay for 32 servants. I'll pay for a beautiful house. You've got to do it. And Calvin said, no, I live within my means. We will not do it. So that's an interesting thing. How often do we hear somebody turning down this kind of stuff? <laughs> Very interesting. Um, OK, but they're heading to the national stage. Um, why? Because of the Boston police strike. Now, some of you remember that, right? Should I test you on it? No. OK. Grace um, had to explain it to some of her friends. Before the strike, Calvin Coolidge said he sympathized with the policeman's drive to form a union. How can you blame the police for feeling as they do when they get less than a streetcar conductor for a salary? The policemen knew they were not allowed to form a union, but they started to do so. And when the police commissioner overruled them, Governor Coolidge backed him. As a result, Coolidge expected his own defeat in the coming campaign for re-election as governor. He thought he would be defeated. Three quarters of the police left their duties, and soon after midnight, September 9th, rioting and disorder broke out. The mayor called out the state guard within Boston and requested the governor furnish more troops. Coolidge called out the entire state guard, and order was quickly restored in the city of Boston. President Wilson declared the strike a crime against civilization. Don't you like that term? And the press praised the governor's action. So Calvin did something really brave. He called out the police, the uh, uh, military, and he thought he would never be reelected to anything ever. When do we see this kind of stuff? It was, to me as a historian, this is so interesting to see someone who says, I'm going to lose, but this is what's right for my country, and I will do it. So he did. I'm sure there's difference of opinion on that, um, because you heard he really was sympathetic to the police. Um, but anyhow, he becomes extremely popular from this decision. He thought it was a terrible decision in terms of popularity. He thought it was just the right thing to do. He thought, that's it for me. I did the right thing. I'm voted out. That's it. But instead, he becomes extremely popular. So what happens? The Republicans 
don't get me on the Republicans, but the Republicans meet in their smoke-filled room and they, during the convention of 1920, and they choose Warren Harding. Warren Harding, who will be manipulated by the bosses. He will do anything they want. And Florence Harding, his wife, who plays ball with everybody. She's, she's the only woman on the convention floor campaigning for her husband. So that's done. OK, then we've got to go to vice president. Oh, the delegates rebelled. The delegates rebelled. They had seen all these pamphlets, have faith in Massachusetts, law and order. The delegates voted in Calvin to be vice president. The smoke-filled room people were furious. We don't think we can control that guy. This is not going to be good. But of course, he's a vice president. He'll never be anything. Don't worry about it. He's just a lapdog for us. So anyhow, he gets nominated. And look how happy the family is. And look at the crowds. In those days, you didn't go to the convention. You stayed home, and they had a big hoopla coming and telling you that you were um, the nominee. So anyhow, he's the nominee. And there's, there they are together. I wanted you to see that picture that they, they can be together. Um, and I have some stuff in my book about how Grace is often sent out to do things because Florence Harding is always ill. Uh, but they, they don't seem to get along that well, but they're OK. All right, I wanted to put this in because Florence says to Warren, I got you the presidency. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> um, she said, it's time for them both to, to do, get to work. And he says, may God help me, for I need it. OK, are you getting the picture? She's really thinking she's going to run things. And he's just going to go along. Very interesting dynamic, I think, in terms of presidential politics. We really haven't had a, a first lady who really says, I'm running everything. You know, <laughs> rest of you can go home. <laughs> so it's kind of a fun story. OK. So Grace knits and behaves herself, OK? <laughs> and they are to live in the vice presidential suite at the Hotel Willard. And one time, uh, a woman, Mrs. John B. Henderson, offers her house and grounds for the vice presidential couple in 1922. Congress would accept this gift and make an appropriation for maintenance. One of the people at the gathering where they discussed this said they heard Florence Harding shout, not a bit of it, not a bit of it. I'm going to have that bill defeated. Do you think I'm going to have those Coolidges from Vermont living in a house like that? A hotel apartment is good enough for them. <laughs> I hope you're getting the Florence Harding thing. We, we need a sort of wicked witch here. And she really is. OK. So, so she says, no, no, none of that. And we all know that eventually the vice president does have a, a house. Remember? They do eventually, but not. Anyhow, Grace makes do with, with being in the hotel. She said that she never knew what her job was, that she suddenly learned of things. But she went along with it, and she you know, could cope with it. Um, and, and that's how I would have to answer um, that, that question. Um, OK, the Hardings go off to tour Alaska. And Florence, remember I told you Florence runs things. Florence said, the, the West has to get to know us. Um, we'll be very popular. Um, we need to do that. She also says that Calvin Coolidge would be replaced on the ticket. I told you, she didn't want him. In her correspondence of April 25th, 1923, and this is when I read the archives, um, a letter from Warren's cousin suggested, from the present point, viewpoint, Governor Loden would be more helpful than anyone else who's been mentioned. Florence, the political pro, knew that a Midwesterner with support from farmers would be a better choice. So she, um, she was already plotting to get rid of Calvin. You probably didn't know that, right? No, she was, he was going to be removed from the ticket. If she had her way, I don't know if she would have had her way. But anyhow, but remember, the Coolidges are visiting. And now we get the Homestead inaugural. Um, July 31, 1923, the, 
the optimistic tone of the bulletins from the bedside of President Harding, ill with pneumonia at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, are received here tonight by Vice President Coolidge. So he's relieved of the tension. But then all of us know about the telegram, right? OK. On the East Coast, the Coolidge's retired from the night. And Calvin's father came up the stairs calling his name. I noticed that his voice trembled, as the only times I ever observed that before were when death had visited our family. I knew that something of the gravest nature had occurred. So they were told about the death of Harding. They sent a telegram to Mrs. Harding. So the telegram was used again. Um, they found a copy of the Constitution, and an oath was typed by the stenographer, who had arrived from Bridgewater. Grace brought in an oil lamp. See, I've got to put my person, Grace, in the picture here. Um, here she is. She brought in an oil lamp, and she was the only woman in the room. They typed up the statement. The reporters raced off. Only one reporter was left in the room to see the actual swearing in of, the, of, the, of, of a father, a notary public, giving the oath to his son, which you all just celebrated. So there's only Joe Fountain left. The Rutland Herald fellow was the only one left. Um, so then, since I'm the writer here, uh, the simple farmhouse in Vermont without a phone, central heating, electricity, or indoor plumbing was the scene of the swearing in of a president. And the official swearing in was his father. Grace Coolidge was the only woman in the room, and from this time on was to be there for him and the country, just as she was during the vice presidential years. So that's kind of how I address this. OK, they came out. And I was told by one of the people in this picture, Dorothy Yates, who maybe some of you remember a little bit, that Calvin was giving out candy. <laughs> so he was giving candy. And there you see Colonel John, his father, the chauffeur. And they're getting ready to go back to Washington. And here they are. Don't they look like a ton of bricks fell on them? <laughs> I mean, they really weren't that ready for this development. But they do go to the White House. But before they move in, they tell Florence Harding she can take her time. Oh, who, why did they do that? <laughs> she spent two weeks burning everything. Oh. Yes. She burned all the evidence. Because remember, it's a very corrupt regime under him. And scandals are going to start coming out about him and his cohorts. And then she moves to McLean, her friend's house, and she burns more. So I, you know, as a historian, I just wish she hadn't, I wish the Coolidges had not done that, given her all this time for burning. But that's what she did. That's what happened. And history lost a lot of evidence, I think, a lot of evidence on those. I think I didn't tell you about what I read about Florence. She even wrote to someone in her papers, just leave 20, uh, 25,000 in the garden and I'll get it. <laughs> she, in my view, she, she has to be studied more. She was extremely corrupt. I think there were payoffs to her. Um, it's a very sad story. But anyhow. We have back to Grace and Cal. We're back to Grace and Cal. And we're back to they're in the White House. And they're going to enjoy their time there. They're, they're to be there. All right. I put this in because this was a stage picture of Calvin, the father, and Calvin Jr. Because John Coolidge told me he and his mother built this roadster. <laughs> These two did not do it. But the boys did enjoy being at the White House. I interviewed, I interviewed John Coolidge a couple of times on what it was like to live there. He said, well, Cindy, I wasn't there that much. I was at Mercersburg Academy. I was only there vacations. Um, he told me a cute story of how he lost his key one time. Did he have a key? Um, and had to be let in. Um, but the boys worked summer vacations, even so. and. Life was to be serious for them. Um, but during Christmas, they lit up a Christmas tree. Grace Coolidge had um, 
arrange for carols to be printed in newspapers, and 10,000 people came to the White House to sing along with those who listened on the radio, and the National Christmas Tree was lighted. So there were wonderful things that, that did happen um, in, in their time together there. OK, Calvin Jr. Um, according to observers of Calvin Jr., he was a regular boy, democratic and unspoiled. It was said he had his mother's love for fun, her humor, her quick wit, but he was still his father's son. He was his father's favorite. Now, some of you know that. It's not good to play favorites with your kids. So those of us who have kids know about that. Um, but he was Calvin Sr.'s favorite kid. OK. On July 2, Joel, and I, ha I should explain, I did go to the National Archives, and I read all the physician accounts um, to put this paragraph together. I'm trying to show you, being a historian, it's difficult work, especially when there's no presidential library for Calvin or Grace. You have, to do, you have to, no, there's nothing. So you have to do it yourself. You have to go find the materials wherever they are to put together your materials. OK. On Monday, July 2nd, Joel Boone, that was the assistant White House physician, arrived to play tennis. Now, he was a good tennis player with the boys and Jim Haley of the Secret Service. So there were tennis courts at the White House. Probably now they've been covered over. I don't think they're still there. But anyhow, they were there. Um, he inquired where Calvin Jr. was. He found him lying in the Lincoln bedroom with Mrs. Coolidge playing the piano. Dr. Boone felt the boy's head and said it was very hot, found some swollen glands. Calvin Jr. explained that he was in a hurry to play tennis Monday. He failed to wear socks and got a blister. Dr. Boone saw a darker blister than one would ordinarily see. I then looked over his legs and found some red streaks. Then I knew we were in trouble in trouble with this. Um, so then they had to confer, of course, with different doctors. And I do have one of the letters that Grace wrote her surviving son, John, about this. Um, Calvin's delirium seemed to be part of it all. He seemed to think he was on a horse. Calvin, the father, tried to pick him up and move him around. He called out, we surrender, we surrender. And Dr. Boone, that's the doctor, said, never surrender, Calvin. He answered, yes. And I was glad he went down fighting. This is Grace writing this. After it was all over, the doctor broke down and cried. I found him at the window and put my arms around him and told him that everything was all right, that he and the other doctors had done everything within their power. And we must comfort ourselves with the thought that courage such as Calvin had shown us all must now be our example. So they didn't have the drugs to save his life. And he did die. And this was pretty rare to have a child die at the White House. We think of the Lincolns, right, that they had children die. But it's, it's pretty, pretty rare that this would happen. Um, Grace wrote this very nice poem. And she did start writing poetry a little bit again. Open door. Do you want me to read it, or are you in a hurry? No, it's OK. It's OK. Um, you, my son, have shown me God. Your kiss upon my cheek has made me feel the gentle touch of him who leads us on. The memory of your smile when young reveals his face as mellowing years come on apace. And when you went before, you left the gates of heaven ajar that I might glimpse approaching from afar the glories of his grace. Hold, son, my hand. Guide me along the path that coming I may stumble not nor roam, nor fail to show the way which leads us home. And many people wanted this poem. This was written after, about five years after his, his death. Um, because I think it is very moving. And Grace, as I said, she's very religious. I've tried to get that across to you. So she has faith. And she feels she's got comfort from um, ministers and from her religion. Calvin. He doesn't have as much faith, and he goes into a lot of depression. And one time, he even sees a little boy trying to get in the White House grounds, and the Secret Service push him away. And he says, no, any little boy that tries to get in the White House grounds, bring him to me. You know, 
You can see he's really struggling. And some historians feel that Calvin lost it, just lost it, for, and that was, that was it for his presidency. He could barely function. I don't agree with that. I feel he did function. He did what he had to do, even though a campaign was coming up and he had to run for, it, for himself. He had to run for office again. Um, they did memorialize Calvin Jr. with a painting at Mercersburg Academy, which is in Pennsylvania. And then this is right here in Plymouth, up the street at the cemetery. The Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts line the road. Can you imagine they'd be here? They'd be lining this road, and they all had roses. And then they went up to the cemetery and placed the roses down. So that you can see what a big group this is of, of uh, honoring um, Calvin Jr. So it was, it was, it was a big, big moment, I think. But Grace had baseball. Did you realize that? She loved baseball, and so she was able to throw herself into baseball and find some relief from her grief. She went to many games in the 1924 World Series. The Washington Senators were against the New York Giants, and during the first game, the president stood up to leave when the game was tied in the ninth inning. <laughs> Grace sputtered, where do you think you're going? You sit down as she grabbed his coattails. The chief executive sat back down. He did pay attention. He stayed for the 12 innings at the seventh game victory. So she would listen to games on the radio, and she would go to games really the rest of her life. I followed her letters about the rest of her life. She used to go to Boston. She had a gang of people that would go with her. And some people called her first lady of baseball. She just loved, loved baseball. It was really something to get her mind off things. And she had her pets. Now, how many people at the White House had a raccoon as a pet? <laughs> Come on. And that was part of my C-SPAN thing. People are asking me about that. Um, Grace and Calvin had an awful lot of pets. And, they, and she one time typed up all her pets and all their names. And the most fun, I think, was the bear, Wild Bill, the wild cat, Princess, Princess Pat, the peacock, rubbery rube, that, oh, that was the hippopotamus, and tax reduction and budget bureau, the twin lion cubs. <laughs> so there were an awful lot of pets. But this Rebecca raccoon was given to the Coolidge's for Thanksgiving dinner. And instead of eating her, they tamed her. I know, is it, are you saying a White House couple? They're taming animals. What is this? I mean, it, it's kind of a fun story. Um, and she. Look at her. Here she is during the egg rolling with Rebecca and the Girl Scouts. And at one point, um, she even explains how much she loves Rebecca. She says, oh, she enjoyed nothing better than being placed in a bathtub with a little water in it and given a cake of soap with which to play. So can you imagine this raccoons in the bathtub throwing the soap? All right. That's the only time I read criticism of Grace Coolidge by the staff. The staff had had enough, <laughs> really. They had to pick up you know, poop. They had to, she was crawling on curtains and tearing curtains. Grace had gone too far. And Grace even had Rebecca shipped out to one of the summer White Houses so she could play with her. I mean, you know, it, it was a bit, bit much. Um, but they did love their pets. And, and the way I look at it psychologically, it was their escape valve. They ha and maybe some of you were like that too with your pets. I mean, it was, she could just feel about the pets and not worry about the world so much when she had this kind of uh, devotion. She also was asked to renovate the White House, which she did. Um, she's the one who suggested a sun parlor so you could absorb uh, Washington without being seen and you could sit up there and relax. Um, so she's the one who did that. She even examined the structural work they were doing with her hard hat on. And she's the one, I know we give Jackie Kennedy the credit for this, but she really was the one who started out thinking about the White House as a museum and collecting antiques for the right periods. Um, of course, uh, Lou Hoover, when she takes over, is so much richer, talk about rich ones, and could do much more with this. But Grace did have the concept that we need to collect antiques 
and consider this a very important place. Um, also, Grace was an extremely good advocate. Here she is with Helen Keller, and she advocated for the deaf. Um, she would arrange for tickets for ball games for the kids, of course, her favorite ball games. Um, and she would have different choirs come in and sing um, at the White House. And look who's happy about the next term. I mean, you know, Calvin's not that thrilled, but she's, she can hardly wait. She called herself the national hugger. She just loved people. She loved hugging them. She liked making them feel good. Um, and she continues with that spirit. She entertains the fancy people that come by, like the Prince of Wales. And here's this gal from, you know, Middlebury, from very conservative, modest background, but she jumps right into it. And she entertains Sergei Rachmaninoff. He, of course, played for the Hardings, but she has him continue, because she did have a real interest in music, um, and arranges uh, for the veterans to come to the musicals. And I wanted to show you some of her outfits, because Calvin said, now, this is Calvin's real weakness, is clothing for his wife. He has to have the prettiest clothes he can for his wife. So everyone noted that about him. And then we have the famous visitor. Um, we have Will Rogers. Now, how many of you remember Will Rogers? Not too many. Oh, a few do. A few do. OK. He called Grace his public female favorite number one person. And um, President Coolidge got all kinds of letters from him, books from him. He was a Democrat. Remember, the Coolidges are Republicans. But he wrote letters and books and to Mrs. Calvin Coolidge. Um, she has the keenest sense of humor that has been my good fortune to encounter. And she appreciates jokes even on their own husbands. And then um, they had this cute exchange. Um, he said he was pleased to meet the first lady. She's chock plum full of magnetism, and you feel right at home from the minute you see her. Grace told Will Rogers she could do a much better imitation of her husband than he could. <laughs> he responded, I believe it, but look what you had to go through to learn it. <laughs> so he was quite the, quite the one. And here are the different movie stars that come. And this is really the first time that movie stars are used to publicize the White House people. Uh, was his campaign, Keep Cool and Keep Coolidge. Some of you remember that one. So the, the modern era has come in now with the Coolidges. We have the radio. We have movies. All of this is starting to influence. And Grace and Cal are embracing it. They're, they're not saying, let's not do it. They're embracing it. Um, and here she is with, with another one of her wonderful outfits. And here's her most exotic outfit, her all gold dress. Now granted, some of these came from Stern's department store <laughs> with uh, Frank Waterman Stern's, but maybe not all of them. And here she is in her white dress, which is what Calvin liked the best. And then I wanted to show you one letter so you can see the types of letters she wrote. Sometimes these were just small things like this, just little letters. Sometimes she typed long letters to people, and I do, did read many of those too, the longer ones. So she sometimes typed, sometimes she wrote. Um, she said she wrote about 100 letters on a Sunday. Think of that. So she really did want to write and communicate with people. All right, we have only son John left now. Talk about an only child. And they have the different summer White Houses for different reasons. Calvin wanted to get around the country to see different parts of the country. And um, they finally, in 27, go to the Black Hills of South Dakota. And here you can have a picture of that, to a game lodge. And Calvin starts thinking. It's the fourth anniversary of his pre succession to the presidency. And he says, if I should serve as president again, I should serve almost 10 years, which is too long for a president of this country. Are you hearing that? Isn't that strange? Someone's saying it's too long. OK. The president wanted to give the Republican Party ample time to find somebody else. So he left the office, and he proceeded to have his secretary type up 
tiny pieces of paper for each reporter. And on those papers it said, I do not choose to run for president in 1928. Can you imagine that little tiny, and he handed them to all the reporters. <laughs> I do not choose to run for president in 1928. And they've saved some of these in the archives, these little tiny little things, okay? And then later on there's a luncheon and Senator Capper sits down with Mrs. Coolidge and says, um, you know, did you know about this? What do you think about this? And she says, oh, isn't it like that man? He never gave me the slightest intimation of this intention. I had no idea. Okay, I found her lying. It's hard when you're writing a book and you find somebody lying, but I did. She had known about this. On March 10th, she wrote her girlfriend. The president has lots of fun telling me that I will soon be walking, riding in streetcars and taxicabs. No terrors lie therein for me. I am keeping my walking apparatus in good trim. And part of the reason they were leaving was due to Grace. She really didn't want to serve in her unelected office another four years. The president didn't want her to have to continue this heavy responsibility. So you can weigh what you think about that. Um, so she said every first lady should make something for the White House. So she made this coverlet. Um, and she was very good, remember, with her um, needles. So that, that fits right in, um, that she would have that. And they said on their retirement, they were going to go to Northampton, but of course keep their Plymouth properties. And um, their wealthy friends said, what can we do for you? We've got a, no presidential libraries existed, but they said, well, why don't you give uh, money to the Clark School for the Deaf to help deaf children? So they raised four million for the Clark School for the Deaf as they left the presidency. That was very thoughtful. It was not for a presidential library. And here they are, and they both start writing articles in their retirement. And there's Blackberry, finally, you're getting to see Blackberry, her black chow. And uh, I think that's either Prudence Prim or one, one of the Collies. Um, and they do go to, to Northampton, but they go to the two-family house, which I showed you earlier. Okay, what's the problem with the two-family house? Yeah. And so she's got presidential gifts. You were allowed to keep presidential gifts in those days. She's got gifts in every friend's house. She doesn't know what to do. And the dogs keep barking at everyone. And Calvin sits and rocks on the uh, porch and says, Democrats, Democrats. Um, so they do have to think about living somewhere else. So they buy the beaches. Now I've given, I think, one or two tours of the beaches. This is privately held. And um, it's very pretty, uh, nice porches, and it has gates, and the dogs could run free. And it, it, it's just uh, uh, lovely. And of course, they, they have left the presidency. And they have something to look forward to. John Coolidge, he met Florence Trumbull on the train going to his father's inauguration and dated her because he was at Amherst and she was at Mount Holyoke. And sometimes the Secret Service man who was assigned to John Coolidge would get lost <laughs> and he would date Florence. So these two married, that's a picture of their, of their wedding. And uh, that was something Grace very much looked forward to. Calvin, the father, had been a little strained with John, his re remaining son. But once John started dating Florence, he really, Calvin, the father, really did become a nice, wonderful guy again. He was, was very difficult for a while there. He was in depression, and he really lashed out quite a bit from the letters that I read. But he, he definitely, this turned a corner for him. However, Grace had to struggle over her husband's health. Frank Waterman Stearns had written that Calvin had backward ideas on medicine will only take medical advice when he sees fit to do so, and will rarely see fit to do so. As president, he did take walks. And um, in retirement, he said, I'm very comfortable because I don't do anything else except I am too old for my years. I suppose the carrying of responsibilities as I have done takes its toll. I'm burned out, but I'm very comfortable. So that's, isn't that a mixed message that we're hearing from this fellow? Um, he did write articles, and there wasn't a, a presidential pension in those days, so he 
amassed some money by writing articles. She wrote articles. Um, but his, he was getting more um, pale and drawn. He took two naps a day and had recurring attacks of asthma and digestive troubles. The man of 59 looked as his father looked at 70, it was observed. Yeah. So one day, Grace um, is coming back from something. And he also came back with his chauffeur. And he went up to shave. And he had a massive heart attack. And he died. Um, and that was pretty shocking. She had no preparation for this at all. Uh, and as I said, though, the taking care of him was, was very, very difficult. So um, she, feel, she felt she wasn't prepared for life on her own. She felt she should, she's got to deal with this, though. Um, so they arranged the funeral. The funeral was in Northampton. One of the pallbearers was the man who shined the shoes on Calvin Coolidge. Um, and then they came up to Plymouth for the burial in Plymouth, which you all know where the cemetery is and, and, and where, he was, where, where he's buried next to his son, remember? He's buried next to his son. All right, and then Grace decides to sell the beaches and really get her life going again. She builds road forks, which I have seen um, the lawyer who was dealing with the, with the house let me go and tour it. Basically, the first floor has nobody living on it. The living space is more the second floor. And look, the uh, porch is up on the second floor. So she wanted privacy. That's what she was looking for. She has Iva Gale, her girlfriend, live with her. She has the chauffeur live with her. Um, but it's kind of a, a private uh, life there. And. She's still an activist. She's still an activist. She was a member of the Northampton, Massachusetts Refugee Committee, which in 1939 attempted to arrange homes for 25 Jewish children, those like Anne Frank fleeing Nazi Germany with nowhere to go. And this is what her, you want to hear her telegram that she wrote? Deeply moved by the plight of victims of religious and per racial persecution in Germany, we would like to have um, our. We would like to have 25 children, and the bill, a bill was developed, and it requested a two-year entrance of 20,000 German refugee children, 14 and under, and this would have been supported by agencies, not the government. And many prominent Americans joined her on this but only 26% of the public supported it, and it went down to defeat. So Grace, I like to point this out. Here she is with real leadership again. She's a first lady, former first lady, and she's saying, please, let's rescue some of these children. Of course, they didn't know the Holocaust was coming, but uh, they did know that it was important to rescue children, and she did want to do it. And when you think of it, what if they had rescued? What if she had had 25? What if she had had Anne Frank at her own house? Very interesting story, I think. She, she, um, when war came, though, she dedicated herself to the waves and loaned her house to the waves. Do you all know what the waves are? It's the women's uh, navy. Um, and, and there she is. And her, do you recognize her in her cap in the middle there, um, looking at the waves? So she was happy to do that. She lived with her girlfriends. She devoted herself to her son, John, and his family. He had two, two daughters. Here she is as an older woman. And then, oh, before, before that happens, I should tell you her own life. She um, was, was starting to fail a bit. And in 1952, at the age of 73, she started to fail. She went to the hospital with a heart attack. She had an elevator installed in her house. Um, she, once in, once in a while, was able to do things like watch television, but it was getting to be difficult. She sometimes went to Plymouth for a walk, if she could. Um, she definitely still had an interest in Plymouth all during the war. But I go into quite a long description here. But basically, she does die, and she is buried next to Calvin. 
And this is a picture, obviously, probably July 4th commemorating Calvin's birthday. But um, she is buried there. And then there's a picture of John Coolidge, as he talked about his mother quite a bit. And there's the wonderful homestead. And that's all I have today. Yeah. But So do people have questions or comments? I've gone on a little bit. I yeah. Did her own family lose anything in the Depression? You know, you know about that? Oh, her own family. Um, pretty much she was set up uh, financially. Um, and then John, her son, worked for the New Haven Railroad. And then he had his own business form uh, company. And then Florence Trumbull seemed to ha the, the governor's daughter seemed to have some funding. And um, they didn't just, I only, you know, I'm kind of narrow biographer her. Um, they seemed to, to do all right pretty well because they had made money with their writings. And I forgot to tell you, when Calvin died, Grace asked 50 people to write reminiscences of Calvin and got some wonderful material and put that together about, about him. Um, even his opponent wrote lovely, comments about Calvin. So, so financially, I would say, no, they, they didn't. But up here in Plymouth was more of a struggle. And during the war, Grace would send money to Aurora Pierce and the group up here in Plymouth and try to keep them going. So the war years were tough. And that is somewhat the Depression years, too. You're right. Okay. So she was well aware that that was tough up here and did her best trying to send some support. But yes, yeah, she was pretty much set up by her writings and her husband's writings. And then Franklin Roosevelt passed legislation that gave franking ability to the First Ladies. So, and even a little, I think, a little support for the First Ladies. So she was able to get a little financial support then, too. OK, other questions, comments? No? Wait, Charles. Uh, just one thing. The, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, Coolidge wrote a lot of the newspaper uh, uh, articles, but he also wrote his own autobiography. Absolutely, and that's what I think they all read the other day. Um, yes, and his autobiography, very good point, made money too, but it was uh, donated. The, the funds were pretty much donated to, uh, I can't remember what cause, whether it was Clark School again or pretty much donated to others. But, uh, but they were okay, yes. She did the oral method at um, the Clark School for the Deaf, which is a tough one. I've been to the Clark School for the Deaf, and I've given talks there. Um, they all wear these radio frequencies. that They have these uh, cochlear implants, and they tried to listen to me through, through that. And then someone next to me would use their lips, because I guess I'm not as clear a speaker as the, the, the experts are. So I would have that when I was down there, um, speaking to them. But yes, it was, it was definitely important. She didn't teach again, no. Um, in retirement, she seemed not to have a plan. But then she figured out, well, I've got to take care of Plymouth. I've got to take care of Northampton. And then you heard about the refugee. She joined that committee and also um, very much volunteered during the war. She created packages for the soldiers leaving for the front. Um, she even helped with the blackout days when you black out things. Um, and look, I know to us, we probably go, you had to do that in Massachusetts? Yes, they, they were worried that something would happen. And so she would even volunteer to look for planes uh, at, at night. So she was very much a volunteer in World War II. I've got to say that. Then she did tour. A, a bit uh, with her friends. And she liked to be part-time in North Carolina with her friends. So I would say in her older age, she, she sort of relaxed a bit. And no, she di didn't, didn't teach at that point. No. But she had been an advocate, as I said. Yeah. Is your book available? My book is available on Amazon for 100 bucks. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, pretty much, this is a terrible publisher, but you can occasionally get one that's a little cheaper. Wait, yes. Why did the publisher make it that expensive? It's too long a story. But this was part of a First Lady series. Oh. 
And um, they worked with this terrible publisher, Nova, and didn't produce it for the masses. I wish it, I could convert it to something else. Yeah, but yeah. How old was the son when he died? Calvin Jr., 16. Calvin Jr., yeah. That was very hard. And then John, as you all know, lived in, into what, 91, do you think, John Dumbo? Yeah, something like that. So he had a very, very um, long life. Um, and, and was up here restarting the cheese factory. And I think the cheese factory is still going, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we definitely should keep the flames going on this Coolidge history and Grace's history. Granted, Northampton is part of the picture. Smith College is part of the picture, too. Um, but it's, it, I think it's a, it's a wonderful story about a wonderful couple. Um, and I think John, did a, the son, did a great job of keeping the flame going. Don't you all feel up, oh, yeah. up at the site and preserving the site? So we have a lot to be thankful for that this history was, was saved. And Grace considered it very important to save history. And I think I gave you that view. Yeah, yes. OK, there were no presidential libraries until Franklin Roosevelt. He created one, because remember, he had four terms, guys. So he felt it was important to have archives and have a presidential library at Hyde Park. Then he re reached back to Hoover, and they created one in West Branch, Iowa, for Hoover. But then now there have been popped up ones. Uh, the Lincoln people developed one. Um, you know Mount Vernon is the one for George Washington. Uh, and then m the feeling was the archives would be at the Library of Congress. So why do you need a presidential library, really? And I think Calvin, if you had interviewed him, he would have said, oh, no, my papers are at the Library of Congress. You can get those, and, and that should be enough. He, he, as you can see, in his autobiography, he said, I wish to return to the people. I am one of them. We should read his autobiography, because it does make you feel better about things, I think. OK, yes. Is always referred to as Colonel. Yes. Colonel <laughs> He, The governor put him on his staff. Um, and John Coolidge, in one of his letters, the son of Calvin, the grandson of Colonel John, said, I'm so proud of myself because the governor of Connecticut has put me on his staff. <laughs> so he was put on the, on the staff. That's how he gets to be a colonel, unless John Dumbo can think of something else. No, that's it, yeah. Yes. Um, do you have a sense of what their relationship was like with the public and with the press? It seems to me that I remember when I toured up there, for instance, there was a picture of him in the apron that you wore outside when you're working to keep your clothes clean. Oh yeah. And that they they said something about oh he just did that for he he just did that for the publicity. And then when he hands out these little slips of paper that says 1928, I'm not running anymore. Was there any, do you have a sense of any friction between either the, them and the press or the public? That's such a good question because Calvin Coolidge liked the press. I want you to hear that. He would sit with the guys, remember they're guys. Right. Uh, Florence Harding would sit with the gals. Um, we gotta give her a little credit for something good. Um, but he would sit with the guys and smoke a cigar, remember he did smoke. Um, and he enjoyed the press. He enjoyed, because he'd say, don't write it down. Just, we're just talking, guys, right? And so there was a lot of don't write it down, just let's talk. But he liked the press. He loved sitting with them and talking to them. He had a ball with them. But he told Grace, no interviews. You're not allowed. Because Florence had flaunted things. Florence Harding had sat with, sat with the female reporters. She had blabbed about everything, and he just said, Grace, no. And I think that was a little too much. I was, but, but think of this. She wore her beautiful gowns. She posed quite a bit. So who would dislike her? Nobody. Did she say anything offensive to anybody? Never. So you have a popular first lady if they don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and they look pretty and act nice. So it's a... And then, yes, there was a, one of the first um, pub publicists worked for, for Calvin's administration. So he did have a publicist. 
and the publicist wanted those movie stars and wanted to keep cool and keep Coolidge. But that came from grassroots people, too. Coolidge was popular. I, have, I think I presented that, didn't I, to you? He was very popular across the country. People liked him and liked the Vermont values. Um, did he fake it? No, he really did wear that, that outfit. And he really had come from a, a farming background and working with, with the um, farmers in, in Plymouth. So that wasn't fake at all. He really did come from that. She came, I think I presented that to you, from more of a city background, didn't she? She was more the only child, the city gal, with her beautiful outfits and being spoiled a bit, being an only child. So she was the city gal. So that's another reason why it's amazing they got along, because, because he was more of a country guy and she's more of a city gal. That's interesting. OK, any other questions? That's it. Well, I've held you here a long time, so live it up. Oh, you have another question? Well, I'm just a little fuzzy on how they became established in Massachusetts. And I, I may have missed uh, something. OK, two, two, no, that's important. Two things. She goes to Massachusetts to be at the Clark School for the Deaf. And did that come up before they married? Or mm hmm She's there because she wants to teach deaf children, and that's where you do it. And Caroline Yale was a leader in the field, and she had met the mm -hmm. Yale family in Burlington and wanted to do it. And remember, her mother says, oh, she won't meet any men. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Calvin uh, had gone to Amherst College. And then after Amherst, he wrote um, a lawyer in, I think it's Burlington, Vermont, and he wrote a lawyer in Northampton, Mass. And he said, um, you know, could I come and read the law? And the guy in Vermont was on vacation. So Calvin only heard from the Massachusetts guy and chose Massachusetts for his career. And probably it was easier going to Amherst College. He'd know people in the area and probably be easier. But he loved coming up to Vermont. And he almost had the career in Vermont. And I don't think we would have seen him nationally because Vermont's such a small state. You need Massachusetts right. to go to the national level, it seems. Of course, we almost had Howard Dean. So it, it can happen. We almost had Bernie. It can happen. It can happen. Did, did he have political ambitions, though, that anybody was aware of? Calvin? Yeah. Oh, yes. He wanted to please his father. It was Because I, I gave, gave you the Grace story. You can have me come back and do the Calvin story. <laughs> Um, he wanted to please his father, and so he, his father had served in the legislature, and he said, I've got to be like my father. I have to do everything to get his approval. I will, and his, his sister had died. So you didn't hear the Calvin story. His sister had died. She had had um, appendicitis and died. So, and she might have been something. I think she would have been a missionary or something, his sister. Um, but anyhow, so he wanted to, to prove to his father he was equally good like, like his father. And politics were a way to go. If you, if you were a lawyer, it was a good way to you know, march, march up. But he, the interesting thing about him is he really wasn't looking for money all the time. And he turns down all the time. So that's an interesting aspect. Especially as a lawyer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now one last question, I guess, and then we should let people go. No, the Clark School now is closed. It was, uh, in, even during my day when I was at the Coolidge Foundation, I still could give talks. I had a great Coolidge day when the deaf children came up and came to Plymouth. But that's closed now. I think you don't segregate now. You integrate um, people with disabilities right into the classrooms. You don't segregate anymore. And that's, that's very different. So that, that school closed. But there's still some colleges we've all, right? For, for people who are deaf, there's still some schools out there. So, yeah. yes. The what? Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. Right. I, I just have one thing to add yeah. for anybody that wants the backstory on the Hardings. Uh, Carol Messier is in the office, in the office, here in the audience. <laughs> and uh, she wrote an eight part series for the Vermont Standard this summer all about Warren Harding. Is that right? So she's here if you have any questions about him and the wife. Right. 
Thank you very much. Yeah.